I'm happy and honored to be able to uh, devote uh, this particular uh, lecture to the subject of Hasidism as one of the four uh, responses to uh, Christ of Traditionalism uh, because they were born in the 1800s and are part of uh, the general trend that I'm going to try to uh, do some justice to uh, tonight. Remember, this is not a, a lecture. None of these are lectures on uh, Hasidus itself. That's a whole series by its, of its own, as you can imagine. That's a gigantic topic. This is uh, obviously a highly externalist focus uh, in order to make uh, some general historical uh, points about trends uh, that do impact upon us today, but I'm on purpose keeping this in an externalist of fashion. I hope uh, you'll uh, be able to get what I want you to get out of it. And so without any uh, further ado, uh, we need to map one. <laughs> okay. Just to reiterate what I said the first night, uh, some uh, extremely basic facts that I'm sure just about everybody's familiar with. Hasidus is a modern movement. Uh, they dress funny, like they're old. And it seems to portray the idea of an ancient uh, kind of traditionalism. But we all know that the Baal Shem Tov lived when he did, and he started the Hasidic movement, as we're speaking about, and he died in 1760. And so that means that this is a, a modern movement. Reform Judaism is a modern movement, and so forth. And secular Judaism is one modern movement. These are movements that arose for the first time in what we call the modern era. Hasidus did. Uh, interestingly, history books are gen generally written by people who are not religious. And... Um, Therefore, they don't usually portray Hasidism as a modern movement, much less as a response to modernity, but of course that's what it is. Moreover, you'll very often read about the fact that uh, such trends as uh, Reform Judaism, uh, Liberal Judaism, Conservative Judaism, Secular Judaism arose in the 19th century in Europe and gained many followers. That's true to some degree. Nowhere near as many followers as Hasidism, which embraces eventually millions of people, as I'm about to say, in the late 17th and particularly, uh, excuse me, the late 18th and particularly the 19th century. And it's usually not portrayed in that fashion, which tells you something about the people who write the history books. Now, um, as I said before, uh, Hasidic movement starts in the 18th century in the map you sort of see over there. Uh, if you put Poland and Lithuania together, it's not exactly the right map, but that was the old kingdom of Poland which once upon a time existed. Yeah, I don't have a... I, thing, thing then a right is... I guess I don't... Do I have a pointer? I, you look... Yeah. Okay. Well, then you'll see where it is. Don't, 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 don't bother. Everybody can figure it out themselves. Right in the upper right-hand corner. So where it says Poland Lithuania, it was one big country. And uh, it was the good old days, so to speak, in which Poland was governed by a, a very non-strong central government. And that uh, the authority resided uh, in the nobles and the landowners in the countryside. And without going into too many details, this meant that you didn't have a government which governed a great deal and that was favorable for the development of movements like Hasidism in the old, within the old traditionalist uh, framework. Um, now, by the time you get to the late 18th century, uh, Baal Shem died in, in 1760, his main successor died in 1772. After that, so what happens is that Hasidus, despite the opposition of Misnagdim, starts to grow and proliferate and, uh, you know, almost mutate into many, many, many different varieties. And this is a process that reaches a feverish rate in the late 1700s and particularly in the 1800s. And so, the main, historically speaking, the main growth of the Hasidic movement in terms of numbers is in the 1800s, which is really strange because it means exactly at the moment when modernity is kicking in most powerfully, one thinks of the 1800s as the beginning of science as the uh, rise of the Industrial Revolution, of the urbanization, and all the other kinds of trends that we associate as being absolutely central, first of all, to the definition of modernity, and second of all, central to the uh, weaning away of the Jews from traditionalism, we find a large, growing, constantly growing movement, 1810s, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, probably as late as 1860s, in the exact opposite direction. Millions of Jews eventually vote with their feet. Millions of Jews go in the opposite direction. It's quite interesting. Millions of Jews in one particular area, the area that you see over here defined as the greater kingdom of Poland, or what you and I call Eastern Europe. If we can switch the map for a second. 
to after 1815? Yeah. Uh, no, no, the next one. There we go. Now I'll leave you alone. Promise. Uh, what you see over here is the way Eastern Europe will look uh, for 100 years. Uh, there are the uh, French Revolution and Napoleonic Wars. By the time all that is settled, you get to the year Congress of Vienna, year 1815, and uh, that is the map where the eastern part, the right hand of the side of the map, remains uh, untouched from 1814 to 1914. So think about what I'm saying. For 100 years, there was complete peace in Eastern Europe, which is a major uh, reason that movements like Hasidism and others, but particularly Hasidism, was able to develop and flourish. Uh, it's quite unique, actually, in the history of Europe to have such an extended period of peace. There were three countries uh, that had carved up Poland. You see Russia over there, but a lot of what you see on the right-hand side about Russia is really the part of Poland gobbled up by Russia. And you see in the middle a little, what is it, orange or something, called the Kingdom of Poland, which belonged to Russia. So it's just has an appearance as if it's independent, but it was part of Russia. And then underneath that you see Galicia, which was the part of Poland which was ruled by the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And then you may see at the top of it, and on the left, uh, it's not clear, the part of Poland taken over by Germany or Prussia. Uh, Hasidus, the Hasidic movement, is a movement which arose and grew and flourished and grew and grew in the part called Russia and Poland and Galicia. It did not happen in the part of Poland taken over by Germany or Prussia. Those areas which are primarily associated with Posen, that means you may have uh, relatives that come from there, uh, that was Germanized. The Jews there underwent a different cultural experience. Uh, they really were compelled early on by the Prussian state to uh, acculturate rather strongly and, and did so. Uh, the famous rabbi from that area in the period I'm talking about was Rabbi Akiva Eger, who was basically unsuccessful in preventing his community from moving in a Germanizing direction. Um, not too far to the east of him, and to the south of them, other things were happening. The other things that are happening is the increasing rise and continuing growth of the Hasidic movement, which, as I said before, you know, just multiplies and multiplies into many, many different dynasties. And because it became so radically decentralized, that served as a source of strength, because you can't go after any one group. There's so many different ones. And another reason it was a source of strength is because it offered so many different ways of doing Hasidus. So if you are into one particular way of worship of God, you can find a group that would appeal to you. If you were turned off by that and you were into a, another group that more valorized, let us say, the study of the Talmud, there were groups like that. If you were into other groups that were primarily interested in mysticism, there were obviously groups like that. If you were into groups that deprecated the masses studying mysticism, there were Hasidic groups like that. And therefore, that proved to be, almost in a capitalist basis, uh, an attractive kind of movement, because everybody could find that particular niche within uh, the movement. Hasidism itself internally, and I don't want to get too involved in this, underwent a number of changes in the period we're talking about over here, simply because you had so many new dynasties uh, starting in the late 18th century and throughout the entire course of the 19th century, many of these dynasties are started by Misnagdim who convert to Hasidism, and therefore carry a lot of their old attitudes into the new way they're doing Hasidism, to just take uh, one or two names that everyone's heard of, the sons of Rav Debrechaim, who was a famous Misnagid, son-in-law of a very famous Misnagdic rabbi, uh, the Baruch Tam, and obviously becomes one of the main Hasidic rabbis and dynasties of the 19th century sons. Uh, there's a today called Kloisenberg and many others. And uh, he was uh, a Rosh Hashiva who switched. And the same thing is true of the ones who founded Ger, for example, the Chedusha Rim. It was the exact same thing. These are Misnagdic. So we find many dynasties being found founded by members of elite Misnagdic families who are part of the power structure of the old traditionalist uh, elite, but they are reinventing themselves. Which means, obviously, that Hasidism is responding to what the Hamon Am wants in a big way. And that certainly is the case. And I'm going to speak about that a little bit. But before I do, uh, I want to call attention to this map because the political reality is very uh, remarkable. Starting from 1814 to 1815, and for 100 years, the Jews find themselves uh, under radically different political circumstances. As you saw in the earlier map, once upon a time there was this thing which lasted for a long time called the Kingdom of Poland. And then it ceased to be. It's not on the map there. 
only in a truncated little form and it's a disguise because the kingdom of Poland was really a province of Russia. So a little more complicated than that, but that's basically what it was. And uh, for the first time, uh, the, the, the masses of Eastern European Jews, what used to be called the Polish Jews, the largest Jewish community in the world in quantity, and certainly the most significant Jewish community in the world in terms of quality, in terms of intensity of Jewish life, the uh, you know uh, leading center of Torah, certainly, the leading center eventually of other forms of Jewish movements that arise, uh, now find themselves under the uh, dictatorial control of uh, Russia and Austria. Right? For the next hundred years, all these Jews are uh, under two uh, bureaucratic centralized authoritarian states, the Tsarist Russia that everyone I'm sure is familiar with. The Tsars of Russia never uh, made peace with uh, democracy or constitutionalism or any kind of limited government. Uh, I'm sure most people know that uh, down to Nicholas II, they're fighting tooth and nail to maintain what they openly called the autocracy. And in Austria, Austria-Hungary under the Habsburgs, uh, they fought a less successful battle to do the same thing, to hold on to their dictatorial um, power. And that means that all these Jews who had nothing to say in the matter, who happened just to be living in this area called Poland, which is the subject of all these European takeovers, uh, find themselves um, under the rule of two uh, powerful bureaucratic centralized states uh, which don't like them. I mean, really don't like them. I want to change them. On the one hand, uh, there's the Austrian Empire that you see in the center of uh, Europe over there. I read you last week about the family laws and how difficult it was to get married. In Galicia, they had a separate set of, of, of gazeros, let's put it this way, implemented as soon as the Austrians took over in 1772 against the various Jewish practices. Um, Russia, I don't even, just to say the word Russia is enough. And, uh, well, it is. And uh, the result is that traditionalist Judaism, what you may call religious Judaism, comes under sustained attack in a way that it never was before, uh, for a century, uh, by the governments uh, that are ruling them. Think what I'm saying. Uh, under the kingdom of Poland, the Polish government, such as it was, weak as it was, uh, never attacked the Jewish religion. They just didn't like them. <coughs> they never went after them. Uh, now, the state is trying to interfere in the good old European paternalistic, uh, autocratic, authoritarian model to change the Jews along with others. Why? Well, you see over there this huge map of Russia which looks like it's one undifferentiated mess. But in truth, the Russian Empire contains dozens and dozens of different nationalities and the Russians don't like that. Uh, they don't like the fact you have such a large number of Ukrainians, of white Russians, of Lithuanians, let alone when you get to Central Asia and these other, the Chechens and dozens of other little groups over here. It bothers them. Why can't everybody be one? That way we'll have an easy job governing them. They don't look how it, from the point of view of the governed, but they want to make it as comfortable as possible for the authorities. So why can't we make everybody a cookie cutter? Austria-Hungary, just to use those words, shows you it's a polyglot empire between the Austrians, the Hungarians, the Poles, the Bohemians, the Moravians, the, the, the Romanians, and dozens of other, or quite a number of other little groups. Once again, it becomes impossible to run as a regular state. Why can't they be like France, where everybody's French? You know, that's what I look at. Why can't they be like Germany, where everybody's Germany? Why do they have the curse of being pluralistic, multicultural, polyglot? And what they therefore want to do is try as much as possible to make everybody the same. If that's true at the level of nationality, and that is true at the level of nationality, that's part of the... Uh, uh, ethnic struggles that still go on in Europe today for those who follow this. Kal uh, when you get to the level of religion, because these are militantly Christian states. The Habsburgs are the pillars of Roman Catholicism back to whenever, you know, back to before Martin Luther. And the Russian uh, Tsars are the owners of Russian Orthodoxy. Therefore, they're heavily the patrons of it. And uh, they really dislike on religious grounds, on religious grounds, the Jews and their culture. And if they had a small number of Jews who were acculturating, like in some small German state, they could allow time to take its course. But they don't have that over here. If you're the Emperor of Austria and you rule Galicia, you're ruling uh, more than half a million, maybe I think as much as three quarters of a million Jews. Think about that. Who are moving in the direction of Hasidism. That is to say, they're moving farther and farther away from Westernization, even more than had been the case before. If you're the Tsar of Russia, same thing. You find movements, for example, Chabad in White Russia, and in the Ukraine, dozens and dozens and dozens of different Hasidic um, dynasties and movements popping up 
attracting enthusiastic followings, often very small followings, but in the aggregate, many, many people, again, moving away exactly from what they want. Strengthening Yiddishkeit, shall we say. Whereas they're interested in the policy of doing the reverse. And so what happens is that from 1815 to, let's say, 1860, uh, these two governments make a kind of, uh, not in cooperation with each other, each one for their own reasons, make a kind of sustained attack upon traditionalist Judaism. Uh, they pass laws, for example, prohibiting the publishing of uh, certain Hebrew books. They try, as Joseph II did, as I mentioned, you know, they, to change the school systems. Um, they pass laws uh, driving up the price for Shabbos candles, uh, for shetels, uh, for they, they prohibit Hasidic garb. Um, they, if you're in Russia, they prohibit rebbes going around from town to town, as was popular once upon a time. Uh, it, they will prohibit the wearing of payas. And uh, these are countries in which sometimes these laws are enforced. And if they are, you can end up a dead or in some prison or something worse. And the result is that Judaism as itself, traditionalist Judaism, the old from Judaism, as they said, was under a sustained a governmental attack, aided and abetted uh, by Jews, by the Maskilim. This is the period in the word, when, when the word Maskil gets a dirty uh, name to it. Now, this is the period when the word Haskalah uh, attains a kind of status and a connotation of a certain treason. Because in Galicia, for example, and in Russia, certain Jewish intellectuals who are very opposed to Hasidism and opposed to many other things and see the government as a powerful agency that can aid them as they can aid it in changing the Jewish reality in changing the culture in a more westernizing and more modernizing fashion join together and basically they say if you will help us with the army and the police uh, we will undertake to uh, change this, to introduce a new school system and compel all the parents to send their children there. Uh, we will compel uh, people to give up certain types of garb and uh, practices, and especially Kabbalah and other horrible things, mystical, which are completely opposed to the sense of 19th century European modernity. And uh, the governments uh, are obviously more than eager uh, to uh, cooperate, and the result is that you have uh, what is unfortunately so often a case in Jewish history, going back to Hanukkah, and that is that it's not only we're being attacked by strangers, but there are many from our own ranks that want to join the strangers. It's very hard. The state of Israel today, one minute political commentary, the state of Israel today suffers terribly from this, in which our own worst enemies uh, come from uh, within the, the ranks of the leadership of Israel. Where the Arabs present always a united front, Israel never presents a united front. And uh, this has always been a, a, a Jewish curse. Uh, Hasidism is partly a reaction to that. Because what happens in the course of the 19th century in both Russia and in Galicia is that the masses of Jews who do not know how to fight against this, and they can't, they're helpless. How can a person fight against an organized state? Um, what they do organically is find themselves drawn in large and, in, and ever-increasing numbers to the new Hasidic movements, which automatically provide a framework for resistance and passive resistance, which proves quite effective in an unexpected way against what the governments want to do. And what I'm trying to say is uh, hundreds of thousands of Jews, and eventually perhaps, perhaps even a million or two million Jews, and maybe more, uh, vote with their feet and join the Hasidic movement not necessarily because they're attracted to this or that uh, set of Hasidic ideas. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Uh, but, and many are certainly attracted to that. But many others move there because that's the strongest form of traditionalist Judaism. I'll put it in simple terms. Suppose the government in Russia says, or the government in, in, in Galicia says, we order every parent uh, to send their children to this new Jewish school that we're setting up in town. And if you don't, there will be uh, severe penalties. Uh, what do the non-Hasidic, traditionalist Jews do? They have no framework for united action. Uh, you have a show meeting. This one says this, that one says that. Some, you know, the more modern types say, well, it's not so bad. You know, we'll send them there for part of the time. Uh, the more traditionalists say, we won't. They get into quarrels. Uh, the rabbi 
in the traditionalist environment is usually a weak figure in the political sense because the rich Balabatim don't want somebody who's uh, very authoritarian and powerful. Um, it doesn't work. And in those environments, and in those communities, for example, as I told you before, it happened in Prussia, the Jewish masses, for whatever reason you want to say, prove uh, helpless to provide a significant resistance to government efforts uh, to make, as I just said before, the kids in the community uh, go switch from their current system of education, or non-education, whatever the case is, to this new government school. However, if you are a uh, Sanzer Chassid, well, then it's real easy. The Sanzer Rebbe said, nobody does it, nobody does it. Uh, why not? That's what being a Chassid means. You just follow orders. I'm not saying that Chassidism was organized as an authoritarian movement to provide a top-down kind of leadership to uh, promote some sort of militant and almost militaristic kind of discipline, but that's what happened. Right? It's a byproduct. It is not the original intention of the Hasidic movement. Never has been. But it's an extremely important byproduct of the nature of Hasidic organization. It replaces, and herein lies its modernity, it replaces the old Kehillah, which had the structure and the framework of a kind of unity, but very often lacked the inner unity. Because this framework was legal and institutional. And people don't always, you know, has anybody here ever gone through a red light? Yeah. Laws go so far. And it replaces it, Hasidus does, with a different type of organization, which is uh, non-formal, <coughs> non-legal, but it is, on the other hand, voluntary. And therefore, it is uh, stronger. And uh, it is more passionate. And it defines itself by uh, people saying, I'm going to become the follower of this person. Nobody's making me, but I'm going to become the follower of this person because that's what I want to do. And the follower of this person means the follower of this person. I may switch and f end up following another person. But there's no such thing as being a chassid without a rebbe. And there's no such thing with a rebbe as just being somebody on a baseball card. It means that you have an authority figure that you accept upon yourself. And if you have an authority figure you expect upon yourself, then it means that when push comes to shove and we get certain challenges and we are challenged by a big powerful state, uh, you have a framework which enables you and everybody else that feels like you uh, to provide an effective passive resistance. Because if no parent sends their kids to the school, and the same thing is true in the five villages around us, they can't arrest everybody. Now in the 20th century they can, that's called Stalinism. But in the 19th century they don't, think, they don't see themselves as able to do so. And so what happens is that in the good old Eastern European governmental, bureaucratic, authoritarian, structural system, uh, they just send reports that say it was all done. <laughs> and well, that's how it happens. You know, it's all done. And the local Jews will bribe. I shouldn't see that word. The local Jews will convince the local <laughs> officials to give a report that, uh, you know, that, that, that we have 100% attendance. And there it goes. And there it goes. And the, and the result is that if there's someone, for example, like me or you, who say, well, I don't know if I buy into all this Hasidic business or not, and they look around to the right and look around to the left, they say, well, I, I see, in a Darwinian sense, it's the 19th century, right? I see that uh, this group will survive, and my group will not, uh, whatever the rights and wrongs are. I see that it's so constituted, the new grouping is so constituted as to provide an extremely effective unit of organization that never existed before. The Hasidic movement provides the only uh, framework of organization for any traditionalist Jews anywhere uh, down to the 20th century. That's quite an interesting fact I just said. Uh, when you look at this map, uh, there were Jews living everywhere. They had no connection with each other in any kind of formal way, and very, very little in an informal way. Every community made Shabbos for itself, as the expression goes. When there were uh, disasters and somewhere, you can appeal for funds, things of this nature, but there's no political framework that exists among the Jews of Europe and among the Jews of Eastern Europe. Perhaps, if you went back into early 18th century beforehand, when they had something called the Vara Barossas, the Council of Four Lands, at certain periods of history, not all, at certain times, they had some kind of common framework, provide united political action, very little of it. By contrast, 
as the 19th century goes on, uh, and you'll start to get Rebbe's with followers of thousands, sometimes tens of thousands, that means you have 30, 40,000 people who are united in a real framework. When he says, we're going to do this and this policy as far as sending money to Eretz Yisrael, everybody's on board. When he says we're going to follow such and such a policy in uh, resisting a government attempt to make everybody switch to schools, uh, the same thing's going to happen. When the Gare Rebbe, for example, in the 1860s says that even though the Russian government has ordered everybody to change their clothes or else, the Russian government in the 1860s and 1870s says the Jews have to change their clothes or else. And the Russian government did enforce this in Russia proper, in white Russia, no, it was to the right of what you see, the Kingdom of Poland. And the Gare Rebbe, who attains a huge following, founder of Gare, says, nobody's moving, nobody's switching. Uh, then all the Russian government can do is imprison him for a short period of while, but then it looks ridiculous that they let him go and they just say, okay, it won't happen. And uh, how does, what do you attribute that to? Hasidism. And so, as I say before, if we ask ourselves a question of why is it that in the teeth of modernity, a counter-modern movement uh, grows and flourishes and, and develops uh, throughout Eastern Europe, then the answer is precisely because it was a counter-modern movement. And precisely it was because in the teeth of modernity. Precisely because it was in the 19th century. Precisely because it seemed to so, so many Jews who voted with their feet, men and women, uh, the only form of Judaism which is so organized and so constituted as to provide an effective means for resisting the encroachments of the westernizing and, 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 and uh, bureaucratic state, the, the absolutist state. And to the Hasidim, they have no question whatsoever. Uh, everything here is involved as one big attempt to undo Judaism, and that is true. The non-Hasidic traditionalists are conflicted on this. And therefore, when you follow them down the 19th century, uh, they fold like a house of cards, unfortunately, over and over and over again. Uh, this is not Hungary. This is Poland. There's a different reality. There's a different set of politics. And the reaction is different. And so, therefore, do not be surprised that almost the whole of the Ukraine, which is, as I say before, in the, I guess the right side of the map, where it says Russia, the SSIA, the whole of the Ukraine goes Hasidic in the uh, 19th century. The whole of Poland, almost, almost the whole of Poland, will go Hasidic decade by decade. And one asks himself, why is it in the 1810s, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and so forth, this happens? And the answer is what I, I would submit. The answer is uh, what I just uh, mentioned. But that's not all. Uh, it's not entirely externalist. There are, after all, let us face it, powerful internalist uh, dynamics within Hasidism. I want to call attention to one or two which uh, are not necessarily given their full weight, although some know about it. And that is that uh, one of the reasons that uh, tens of thousands, eventually hundreds of thousands of, uh, let's say women, that's a good question. Hasidism doesn't provide a great place for women. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a historic fact that the hundreds of thousands of women, uh, with the husband's consent, without the husband's consent, if you read the records, in the late 18th century and all through the 19th century, during the Hasidic movement. You know what I'm saying? The husband is a misnagin, and the wife goes to a rebbe. Uh, how, do you, how, how do you explain that? And uh, that has to do, of course, as I said before, with the set of powerful internal dynamics of Hasidism. One of the most powerful is a very strong... A, uh, a rhetoric and ethos of anti-elitism. Uh, we all know the worst part about going to school is the cliques. Huh? Or maybe you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> There's the in-group and the out-group uh, for boys and girls. And uh, really, it's a terrible shame. And for too many kids, uh, their years in uh, school and junior high and high school and so forth, are not necessarily years later on that they look back to with, with fondness. Um, like I said before, I'm not going to ask any personal questions. But I think many of you know what I'm talking about. And it has to do with the idea that people are so constituted at the uh, sociological level that uh, they immediately have this tendency to form into in-groups and out-groups. And if you're in the in, it's great. If you're out, it's, it's not so good. And uh, Jewish life has always been characterized by this as my, a, 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 same as any other group. Uh, in the formal official sense we're against it in the practical sense you've had this forever the Baal Shem Tov and the successor of the Baal Shem Tov were very opposed to this and they meant it they really took on this idea of elitism which they came at, at from a strictly spiritualist 
point of view. This is one of the key elements of, of Hasidus, which is that you can't... Uh, it's, and it's not a phrase. It, it, they mean it. And we can't have a situation we are in principle opposed. God does not like a situation which is an in-group and an out-group. And the Rebbe's in, in Europe uh, fought against this and preached against this uh, very powerfully. Now, they of course are the in-group. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Don't, don't laugh and don't smile. If one person is the in-group, then it means everybody else isn't. Do you see what I'm saying? If there's one central person, then it means everybody else is not central. Then everybody else is equal among themselves. It's a different principle of organization. They never had this before the 18th century. But when it started, you see, people naturally gravitated to it. Because a person says, a woman, a boy. So I'm never going to be the Rebbe, but there's only one Rebbe. Everybody else in this particular group is officially the same. They are rich and they are poor. Right? They are the more learned and the less learned. It was totally, especially in the 19th century, totally against the Hasidic ethos to claim or expect any kind of special status as a result of your superior learning or as a result of your wealth. As a matter of fact, um, and this is not true of every single Hasidic group, but it's true of 95% of them. Because this is you know, true of the movement a as a whole, that the individual will find a dignity located within a Hasidic group, ironically within the context of a kind of authoritarian mystical structure with a central person as the top individual, uh, but with all that, in terms of everyday reality, one will find a dignity, a covet in there that he certainly will not find in the traditionalist Judaism, in which case there's a few learned people, there's a few rich people, and everybody is Afro Dalma. Everybody else doesn't count. You know, it's when all said and done, uh, what can the regular worker, the, the tailor, the laborer, what can he do if he sits down uh, in the same car? for two hours with the Note of Yehuda, with the Vilna Gon, with the Panei Yoshua. Yeah. Even if they're nice people, what, what, what can they talk about? The Hasidic movement organized itself over the period of the 18th century and really took off with the 19th century along the lines that every Hasid has the right to have a interviews and connections and go to the Rebbe for brachas and all that sort of thing, which means nobody gets turned away. Men or women? A rich or poor, boys or girls, uh, this is not a little thing. It means, especially with an Eastern European context in which they're used to an aristocratic, aristocratic environment, uh, everybody is a full paying member. Everybody has the privileges of membership. I can't tell you how, how powerful this was. Uh, in the Hasidic world, they were opposed to yeshivas all throughout the 19th century. I'll say it again. Outside of Hungary, where they had to compete with the Khamsam silver types, so it was a special case. But in Poland, and by that I mean what you see over there, the map of huge Russia and the kingdom of Poland over there, throughout the 19th century, the Hasidic masters, the Hasidic rabbis, were very powerfully opposed to yeshivas. Now, they were not against learning. As a matter of fact, it's a common myth that the Hasidic movement attracted uh, Amaratsim. Now, this was not true in the time of the Baal Shem Tov. It was not, certainly not true later. If anything, the Hasidic movement, particularly after the time of Baal Shem Tov, particularly in the 1790s and onwards, when you have many of these elite members of Misnagdic families converting to Hasidism and starting their own dynasties, the study of Torah, the study of Gemara, in a very intense level, becomes valorized in a way that it hadn't done before. Uh, there were some differences with the Misnagdim over certain ideological aspects of that, which are too arcane to go into here, but take it from me, there was a huge amount of learning going on in the Hasidic world, and they produced many, 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 I mean, tens of thousands of tremendous Talmudic scholars. This was not a movement of the unlearned, although it included the unlearned. And it was a movement which said, just because you know Shas, and this one does know Shas, don't sit in front of him at the table. Just because you may be more knowledgeable doesn't mean that this person has any less cover than you. It's important. But why was the Hasidic movement opposed to the institutions of yeshivas? And uh, the answer is they saw them as, as something horrible and uh, breeding grounds for elitism. 
which is true. <laughs> no, no. We'll see later on if if we get to it in the lectures. I don't know uh, if we manage to survive this. The uh, <laughs> but uh, the Lithuanian yeshivas organize themselves and still do totally around 100% embrace of the notion of radical elitism. The Hasidic movement strongly disagrees with the Lithuanian yeshivas in this regard. This is a machlokis in Hashkafa. Right? They are very opposed to this. And although there's been some cross-pollination in this after the Second World War, nevertheless, it's important to know, particularly 100 years ago and before that, that the Hasidic movement was in principle opposed to anything that would encourage elitism of a special group of bachrim, a special group of boys, and these guys are hatsi tatsi and all the rest. That's very opposed. Therefore, the Hasidic uh, leaders in Poland and across the Ukraine and places like that, in many, many, com I mean, thousands of communities, you had people who uh, think about this. If you went to a town in Poland or Ukraine, uh, you'd find a base menish. For example, show like Erzberg's or some, or Glen Avenue, show like Goda. People just come there and learn every day. There's no Rosh Hashiva. There's no mashgiach, there's nobody punching the clock, there's no such thing as getting a kanas for not showing up on time, there's no such thing as somebody, as we develop it now in the modern yeshivas, who's watching you all the time to see that you're learning and doing the right thing. People just come. When you don't want to come anymore, you don't come. When, you want, when the time comes that you feel you have to go out and get a job, you get a job. You want to learn half a day, you learn half a day. And this system, in which there were no formal controls, flourished until the First World War. I'll say it again, it flourished uh, until just before the First World War when the Hasidim found themselves compelled in the 20th century to copy Lit Litvak Malam and make yeshivas. That's a big change that kicks in into Hasidism uh, late in the day, not in the 19th century, but at the beginning of the 20th century, which speaks volumes about what's going on in Europe as far as modernization is concerned and the challenges, uh, the unprecedented challenges of the, of the 20th century that worst of centuries in Jewish history. 20th century, without question, was the one you and I lived in. Is it, <laughs> the, it was, was, without question, the worst century in Jewish history. I, I, I imagine you would all agree with me. And, which is interesting, we usually think of history being progressive, things are getting better. Uh, not necessarily. And, as I say before, uh, you found, Shtiblach they called it, Besmedrish, the old model, in which case, it's not necessarily to have, as I say before, Rosh Hashiva, there's some guy in town who will give what you would call a shir in a, in a formal, informal way, and people want to learn with them, they don't want to learn with them, and you'll pick up, and what I'm trying to say is, they're self-starters, and they're self-disciplined, or they're not, and uh, they're self-motivated, and they produced uh, very many people who were learned to one degree or another, some of them very learned. And they didn't need, as I say before, all the formalities that come later on associated with the Lithuanian yeshiva model, which has become the norm today. And uh, it's funny that a movement like Hasidism would be, so to speak, anti-yeshivish. And yet, as I tried to explain, it wasn't that they were opposed to the study of Torah, uh, but they didn't like the um, unpalatable associations that come out of the study of Torah in what they call an elitist fashion. The Baal Shem Tov himself, way back when, said that anybody who learns Torah and he doesn't do it lishma, the Torah that they learn is pogum. And this was an extremely controversial uh, statement. You can imagine the Lithox went berserk on this, and they did in the in the eighteen hundred in the eighteenth century. And uh, you know, and you can certainly understand why. In spite of all that, they maintained this ethos throughout the growth of Hasidism. And so, when you're joining over here, it's a movement which certainly combines traditionalist life. It certainly valorizes the study of Torah in a deep way. Um, in fact, if anything, Hasidism might even add to it by adding a layer of Hasidic literature onto the Gemara and the uh, normative literature the, the, of the familiar, of the traditional world. Uh, but it does so w with a strong um, message being sent that uh, do not allow this uh, knowledge that you have to corrupt you through arrogance. And uh, that proves to be very popular among people. Once again, if you're a young person in Galicia, or in Poland, in the 1820s, or in the 1860s, uh, you may see that this person is saying become a Moscow, and that person is saying go this way, and another person is going that way. But you perceive that for the five or ten families 
that belong to this Hasidic group. Uh, everybody there is all for one and one for all. And they mean it. And that whenever the kids go somewhere, they take everybody with them. And there's no such thing as these five kids going somewhere on Saturday night and leaving everybody else home. Uh, then you say, I guess, if you're a kid and you're 10, 15 years old, you say, I want to join that group. And the social framework and the valorization and the validation of each and every person simply because they are a Jew is, uh, in, to my mind, the most important internal dynamic that explains the explosive, explosive growth of Hasidism uh, in the 19th century when, when uh, a modern historian would not have ex expected this. Um, when you look, as I said before, at the case of uh, Galicia, we find that the Austrian government, the imperial authorities, tried to impose um, westernization, uh, modernization, with an ultimate goal of conversion uh, throughout the first several decades of the 19th century. The Jews who were not Hasidic, by and large, uh, switched. Uh, either the parents, or the children, or the grandchildren, uh, you can just trace it down. And uh, those that did not, uh, did so by becoming Maskelim. Uh, which meant that in Galicia, in the 19th century, it's a cultural uh, um, um, trend. These are people who embrace what we call the Wissenschaft des Judentums, the, the modern study of Judaism. Jewish history becomes very popular among these groups. Uh, these are small minorities. The people all around them join Hasidic movements of one kind or another. Different dynasties are, po are, are, are more popular in different areas, but uh, this becomes the increasing uh, reality. The Maskilim and the government feel very uncomfortable with this, and there's uh, real clashes in the uh, bureaucratic sense in the 1820s. But the Hasidim lasts through their power of passive resistance, and they're no fools. They learn how to play politics, and they know how to do this down till today. And they're able eventually to get to the big shots in the Austrian government and say, do you really want the Jews to lose their religion? Aren't you afraid that if the Jews become not religious, uh, they might not become Catholics, they might become socialists, they might become anarchists, they become uh, Polish patriots. Do you really want to go that way? Isn't it smarter for the government uh, to leave the Jews uh, in their Hasidic superstition? This is what the Hasidim say. And after a while, it drips in to the imperial authorities, and eventually Metternich and the Austrian emperor, they say, you know, it's a good point. And they leave them alone. And so they beat the Maskilim at their own game, because the entire effort of the Maskilim was to enlist the imperial government, the authorities, in their campaign to change Judaism, uh, the Hasidim, learning the ropes, organically how to do the politics of the new reality of the 19th century, uh, they eventually establish better relations uh, through various means which we won't go into. They, uh, uh, they find other ways of establishing connections with the authorities and making the case to them. And so indeed, by the time one gets to the 1840s, and certainly after that, the Austrian government gives up totally on trying to change the Hasidim. And from then on, the Austrian Emperor Franz Josef becomes very popular <laughs> because uh, he leave him alone. And he did. And the reason is because for the Austrian government, they said, we have enough of a headache trying to control the Poles and the Ruthenians and the uh, eastern part of Galicia, you know, the, the Bukovinians and all these different groups, let alone the Hungarians and the, and, and the Bohemians and the Moravians and the uh, Romanians and the Italians and the Tyrol and, and the Croats. And especially when they pick a Bosnia and Herzegovina, you can just imagine what they're doing. And then they look at the Jews and the Hasidim and say, oh, it's not a problem. They're not, all they want to do is be left alone. They don't have any demands from the government. They don't have any political agenda. They're not looking to uh, secede. They're not looking to set up their own state. As a matter of fact, for the Hasidim in the 19th century, the ideal form of government, short of the Mashiach, is a benevolent Christian monarch. So... What had been a poisoned relationship in Galicia transforms itself as a result of the process I just said into a uh, positive relationship uh, down to uh, the First World War. Again, tonight is the uh, yard side you're talking about Rebbe and Hertzberg. If you talk to Rabbi Hertzberg, who was a soldier for Franz Josef in the First World War, he would tell you the best years were before the First World War. Right? 
and I imagine your mother also felt that way. They're because, and there, even though there was tremendous poverty in Galicia, and there were tremendous difficulties, and there really was even starvation there, all the rest of it, but the government played fair. And before the First World War, under the Habsburg monarchy, as they called the Austro-Hungarian government, once the government made peace with them, as I just said, and they realized it doesn't pay to uh, uh, mess with them, uh, then they uh, adopted a policy of impartiality and meritocracy in government jobs. And so Hasidim could get a job with the railroad, with a government commission, with a, a store, um, with uh, anything that involves uh, public uh, you know, uh, funding. And uh, it was a free country, so to speak. And uh, they thought it's ideal. And so the problems that uh, characterize Hasidic life um, radically ameliorate in the 1840s, 1850s, and uh, then the Hasidim had, had, had free sailing until the terrible 20th century, until the First World War, when uh, all that gets radically disrupted, because the First World War is fought right in Galicia, among other places. And uh, gigantic armies clashed, uh, all through, from 1914 to 1918, uh, right there, uh, without going into all the details. And uh, the First World War, which is something I guess I'll have to address in the future, uh, was just a terrible disaster for the Jews in Eastern Europe in general, the Hasidim in particular, the Hasidim in Galicia in particular, particular. And, uh, you know, that whole episode changed for the worse. Let's move to Russia. Again, we find a government which was committed to opposing uh, traditional Judaism and certainly Hasidism. Um, the Russian government never did make peace with the Jews. Uh, they never did do what the Habsburgs in Austria did, which is to wake up and say, maybe we should not be pursuing this policy. The Russian Tsars were five stupid men, who were, they were, who were committed throughout the 19th century to dragging Russia back into the 16th century. And, well, and they did do so, and uh, Russia pays the price till today. They never did give their own citizens uh, civil rights, they certainly never did give the Jews civil rights, and the result is that even though Russia is sitting on a gold mine, and they have the largest land mass in the world, and the largest number of natural resources, they're still a poor country. And if you take away their oil fields in Baku today, uh, they're a dirt poor country. And there's no reason for that. It's Russia is still a, a country till this day in 2007, which has a large deficiency of infrastructure and roads. Most of the towns in Russia, most of the towns in Russia outside the cities have dirt roads. And the year 2007, they have not made the smartest choices uh, in the last 200 years. And uh, nevertheless, the Tsars of Russia knew this. They were so committed to what they considered Russian essentialism, keeping the true Russian character and all that, uh, which they saw the Jews being violently opposed or dangerous to, that uh, they were willing to pay the price of lack of progress if they could keep the Jews down. And so there's no happy ending when you get to the Russian Empire. But throughout the 19th century, the various czars of Russia, and I'll have to deal with this more in a future class, the various czars of Russia endeavored to weaken, uh, in a stupid way, uh, Jewish traditionalism and Hasidism, uh, and I say stupid way because you tell me, we all know what happened. Exactly what the Hasidim said in Austria. The Jews will lose their religion, uh, they will not become Russian, they'll become revolutionaries. Uh, who killed the Tsar of Russia? Who made the Russian Revolution? Who fueled the socialist movement and the Bolshevik movement? And who did all this? If the Russian Tsars would have been smart, they would have funded all the yeshivas. <laughs> they would have given millions of dollars to these rebbies. Let them sit in their rooms studying the Talmud, and they, they would get out of the way. And all these people that you and I are familiar with as the uh, famous and notorious revolutionaries of the 20th century would have uh, had a different uh, career if they wanted to go that way. Of course, it would have been smarter to embrace liberalism and democracy, but you can't expect that much from Russia. <laughs> now, that's, that's what happened. So, in the case of Russia, the um, czars, starting from 1825 on, basically declared war against uh, traditionalist Judaism. And in Russia, there are different areas that they controlled more strongly and less strongly. Uh, for example, white Russia uh, was controlled more strongly by the imperial government and the gazeros of the Tsars of Russia were able to be enforced there more rigidly and 
From 1825 to 1855, the first of these artists, Nicholas I, uh, went after the Jews with a will, and he prohibited, for example, Hasidic garb, which is why the Lubavitch can't dress in, 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 in Polish Hasidic garb. Right? He wouldn't allow it. Uh, you get killed, you get arrested. Um, they went after people who wear payas. If you wear payas in Russia, in white Russia, in Lithuania, they'll, ch they'll chop, they'll, the policemen on the street will cut it off with a big scissors and take part of your ear with you. They'll just do it. Uh, this is not America. Uh, they will uh, make, as is notorious, all these laws which basically say, uh, by the time they're interpreted, that you can draft all these kids and send them for 25 years into the Russian army. You can imagine what the Russian army is today. And now I'm going to ask you to imagine, if you can, what the Russian army was 150, 200 years ago. Uh, 25 years. And what's that all about? If not a huge attempt to implement a conversion by force. Uh, they will implement many, many other restrictions and laws uh, which are aimed at uh, cutting away and uh, crushing the Jewish spirit. And they will be aided in Russia by these masculin. And the Orthodox Jews, the Hasidic Rebbe's and the others will not succeed in convincing the Tsarist authorities that you're choosing the wrong allies. They do not see it that way. Uh, the reason Russia doesn't see it that way is because uh, Russia acquired the Jews as a booby prize. Russia was a country which until 1772 bordered on Poland and they always wanted to gobble up Poland. And the reason they wanted to gobble up Poland is obvious. They wanted it as strategic depth. You don't want a country near Moscow. You want your borders as far away from Moscow as possible. Poland is next country over. If it's possible, you want to take that over so that any invader will not be able to get to you. Which worked. That's why Napoleon wasn't able to successfully invade Russia. He was a couple weeks behind. Right? He got caught in the winter. That's why Hitler was not able to get where he wanted to get before the snow kicked in, in December of 1941. There's a political, strategic logic to the Russian policy of conquest and annexation. But... It also means that you get a lot of people along with it. And as I said before, this wasn't the terrible 20th century, which you just round the up and kill them, uh, through one means or another. This is the 18th and 19th century where people, even the Russian czars, were more civilized. And so when they picked up all of the kingdom of Poland, they got all these Ukrainians, they got all these Poles, and God help us, they got the largest Jewish community in the world. And they didn't know what to do with it. And the Russian government never did make up its mind what to do with this gigantic mass of Jews that they acquired and didn't want. <coughs> Prior to the Russian acquisition of Poland, no Jew lived in Russia. That's the way they liked it, that's the way they wanted it. Even Peter the Great, that famous dictator who was so violent to his own subjects, was asked, when he was asked, in the late 1600s, why don't you let the Jews in Russia? He said, even I can't do that. And yet, this same country now acquires, they say, this gigantic Jewish uh, population, which is in the throes of spinning, of developing into this huge Hasidic movement. So not only are they Jewish, they're getting more Jewish. And the Russian government could not make up its mind, and still can't, 200 years later, what to do with this large group. What I'm trying to say is that, you know, everybody wants to get the money. When you get the money, then you have to decide how to use the money wisely. They got their land, and they got all these subjects. But then they had to make up their mind how to use these subjects. And they couldn't do so. Because they're so prejudiced that they could never give up their real dream of converting all to Christianity. Now you know, and I know, that the idea in the 1800s of somebody taking several million Hasidic Jews, let alone others, uh, 300,000 Lubavitchers, and converting them to Christianity, it's crazy. They wouldn't recognize that reality. They couldn't make peace with it. And because they couldn't make peace with it, uh, they paid the price in having a dysfunctional Jewish policy. And one of the results, as I said before, was it created revolutionaries. But another result is that the Jews themselves never found themselves in a stable relationship with the Russian government. But rather, policy veered back and forth throughout the 19th century, and still does. So, under Nicholas I, the idea was to Russianize everybody as much as possible. He opened all the public schools and universities to them. Uh, he said, why don't you come in? Of course, he didn't tell you the second half, which is, 
Once you come in, we'll try to convert you. And anyway, if you get a job, if you get a degree, you won't be able to practice it without converting. And uh, just to give you an idea what the social pressures were like, Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, famous Yisrael Salanter, at one time in his career, he lived many years, uh, contemplated trying to implement some kind of Torah Derecher's program in Russia. He was playing with this idea. And he allowed one of his students, or maybe even encouraged him, to go to medical school. And the idea will be, this is in the 1840s, and the idea will be, you know, if you'll go to medical school, you become a doctor, and you'll still remain in Shemr Shabbos, this will exercise a salutary influence on other young Jews and show that modernity is not necessarily <coughs> incompatible with religious orthodoxy. The guy converted. And for so long, he never got over it. It's one of the reasons that he had a certain uh, religious depression right, for the rest of his life. He never got over it. But that was the reality over there. So on the one hand, under Nicholas I, there was a frontal assault on all aspects of Judaism. And then when Nicholas I dies, the government shifted uh, gears, and under Alexander II, who ruled from 1855 to 1881, they tried to lighten up the burden a little bit, even though he didn't like them. But he said, well, let some of the Jews move into Russia proper. We'll uh, do away with the drafting of the little boys in the Russian army. We'll abolish some of the special Jewish taxes. We'll e e uh, encourage more people to go to universities. Will actually allow a few of them to get job, a few of them to get jobs when they graduate from the universities. Okay, and that encouraged a large assimilation. But then, in 1881, he gets assassinated, and then you have the next emperor, Alexander III. Oh, there are too many Jews in the universities. There are too many Jews in the colleges and the public schools. There are too many Jews trying to Russianize. We don't want this, and therefore they impose a numerous clauses. They say that no Jews, basically three percent, can go to college or go to any kind of a school, and uh, the Jews. Uh, actually have to be expelled even from those areas within Russia that they were given permission to live in. In fact, he shrinks the Pale of Settlement. He declares entire areas of Poland, which had been inhabited by Jews forever, to be off limits to Jews and forces often in the middle of the winter these whole communities like Anatevka, right? They have to leave and, uh, you know, in spite of all the hardships. And what are the Jews supposed to do? And then he dies after 12 or 13 years in 1894 and then comes Nicholas II, who definitely can't make up his mind what to do. He hates the Jews with a passion. This is Nicholas Alexandra. And on the other hand, he doesn't want to become revolutionaries. On the other hand, he says they already are revolutionaries. On the other hand, we should encourage them to be Zionistic. On the other hand, no, we don't want them to be too nationalistic. And uh, the only realistic solution they come up with, which is no solution, the only so realistic solution that they come up with under the last two stars is move to America. Which uh, four million Jews do. Listen. Had World War I not happened, and had the United States not passed the Johnson Act in 1924, it is possible that millions of more Jews would have left the Russian Empire and gone to America. It's okay with me, I'm sure it's okay with you. You know, nobody can foresee the future. Uh, but this is a non-policy. The Tsar himself said, and Count Ignatiev, the, uh, the uh, Prime Minister, the Interior Minister said, what are you complaining about bad conditions in Russia? The door to the West is always open. They did not do what the Soviet Union did in your time and my time, which is not permit Jews to leave. On the contrary, if anybody can go, give them to hate. You know, take your, take, take your money with you. It's interesting. And millions of Jews did do this. And what I'm trying to say is that if we want to understand anything at all about the uh, position of Hasidism in the Russian Empire, in this huge area, uh, from 1815 to 1915, you have to understand that it's having to locate itself within a crazy political and cultural environment in, in which there's no solution offered by the system for them. And that all they can do, therefore, is struggle, and they do so successfully, to hold on using traditionalist, traditional Hasidic, by the late times there's a Hasidic tradition, uh, methods of developing tight groups, uh, Developing uh, local groups, uh, organizing yourself around your Rebbe, developing your own Hashkafic set of institutions, um, but it was tougher for them. And that's why groups that developed in the Russian Empire, like Lubavitch and others, had to grow up to be tougher. Because the outside government was always hostile. <coughs> and nowhere near like the communists came later, but nevertheless, the entire message that the official authorities in the system were sending was, we hate you, we don't like you. Uh, why don't you change? Why don't you convert? Why don't you get rid of that ridiculous garb or leave? Go somewhere else. 
it's easy for me to stand here in Baltimore and give a speech about it. We live in a country in which we don't get these messages. Uh, if somebody did, uh, they would react to it in a very different way than we react to our political system. Okay, take a break. Okay. Take one minute? Yeah. And so the point I want to leave you with tonight <coughs> is that when we look at what works in the 19th century, uh, in the teeth of modernity, uh, Hasidus becomes uh, not only one of the four important models, uh, but the most successful in terms of numbers, and arguably in terms of quantity. That depends whether you're Hasidic or not. But no question at all, objectively speaking, in terms of numbers, this proves the trend, the movement that is the most uh, powerful in preserving uh, non-European, anti-modern, anti-assimilation, Judaism, as much of pre-Hasidic traditionalist Judaism as any other movement, or more than any other movement. And they do so not because they planned to do so, but because organically they evolved methods of organization and uh, leadership and uh, discipline that was unmatched by any other group. Like I said before, it wasn't a matter of political science that the Baal Shem Tov sat down and said, how are we going to develop some kind of authoritarian structure? Uh, <coughs> Well, on the contrary. That's the funny part about it. It just happened. But what it really means is that it developed organically. I, notice, I don't believe it just happened. I believe it developed in response to the conditions that I've been describing. But I want to particularly leave you with this notion. Hasidus redefined the Kehillah. Hasidic movement represents a successful successor model to the Kehillah. The Kehillahs in Eastern Europe, where Hasidism existed, uh, continue to exist down to the Holocaust. Uh, they were not dismantled. Uh, the traditionalism of the Jews, the Hasidim and non-Hasidim, was such that they viewed the existing Kehillah, which was there for hundreds and hundreds of years, as something positive to be retained. Side by side with it arose and developed a much more powerful Kehillah. Without any kind of coercive power, without any kind of formal structures, without any kind of taxation power. And yet, in spite of that, or perhaps precisely because of that, the new model of the Kehillah, much more flexible, people come and go when they want. You can leave Hasidus if you want, you can switch from one Rebbe to the other if you want. Precisely because it was voluntary, the attachment of the members to it was stronger. Tocqueville noticed this about America around the same time, right, in the 1830s. Precisely those institutions that are voluntary very often attract a stronger attachment on the part of their members than coercive formal organizations do. And by the time you get into the middle of the 1800s, all the opponents of the Hasidim are throwing up their hands. It's fascinating to see, and historians have done this, fascinating to trace the uh, Jewish newspapers of uh, Eastern Europe, who were all Muscillic in the course of the 19th century. There are Jewish newspapers in Polish and, and Czech and other languages, and, as well as Yiddish and German, uh, throughout the uh, 19th century. And you see, when you get to the 1820s and 30s, they're constantly calling for the government to dismantle Hasidism, and they're always saying that this is a crazy movement, which is soon going to be gone. It's a passing uh, phase. It represents a fever. Uh, the great Jewish historians of the 19th century, such as Gretz and Weiss and others, they all say, how do we account for the fact that so many people are, are, going, are, 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 are going for this movement? It's a, it's a temporary mishigas. Oilam goilam. Everybody follows something for a short time. It's a bunch of Elmer Gantries. You know, the people are like that. We find in other cultures that uh, these things uh, flash in the pan, come and go. But then you get to the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, and the old timers are still using this rhetoric. And the young ones are saying, maybe we don't understand the nature of this Hasidism. <laughs> and then you get to the 1880s and 90s and early 1900s, and then you say, this is a very powerful movement which has to be opposed. Mm -hmm. And then you get past the early 1900s, and all of a sudden, the Maskilim and secular Jews and other Jewish types, they say, maybe we should embrace a, a version of Hasidism, which they call Neo-Hasidism, 
which has nothing to do at all with Hasidism, in which nothing at all, in which case they say maybe there are elements of this which we can use, let us say, for Zionism. Maybe there are elements of Hasidism which we can successfully incorporate into conservative Judaism. Maybe there are elements of Hasidism that we can somehow or other incorporate into Jewish uh, German modernity. Uh, and whole bunch. In other words, I hate to use the word again, but in a Darwinian sense, Hasidism shows itself to be not a passing fail, but it shows itself to be a central Jewish movement. In fact, listen to what I'm about to say. The most successful Jewish movement in the modern era, in terms of numbers. It is the single trend within Judaism that attracts the largest numbers. People don't pay attention to it because it's all, all located in Eastern Europe. Right. People, historians generally, intellectuals, are more interested usually happens in places like Central Europe and Western Europe and places like that, especially in light of the fact that we all know that Eastern Europe eventually was wiped out. But if you go back 100 years, that wasn't the case. If you go back 200 years, that definitely wasn't the case. The area in the world which had the single largest Jewish population, much larger than the rest of the Jews in the world put together. If you had all the other Ashkenazim and all the other Sephardim, there weren't as many as lived in the Kingdom of Poland in these areas what you and I call Eastern Europe. And probably a majority, and, uh, you know, it's, it's very probably a majority of these Jews embrace Hasidism, if not more than a bare majority. Think of what that means. When you get down to the First World War, there are 18 million Jews in the world. Uh, where does the great majority of the 18 million Jews live? In the area I just pointed to, Eastern Europe, the old kingdom of Poland, chopped up as it is between the Austrian Empire on the one hand and the Russian Empire on the other. Um, a few of them moved to America, that's true, so that still leaves you with, what, 12 million Jews in the Russian Empire? Something like that. Uh, including all of Poland, all the Ukraine. Uh, what are the Jews there? <coughs> they have all embraced Hasidism. They're gigantic numbers. We do not realize the tremendous hit that was taken by the Hasidic movement by the 20th century, by the first half of the 20th century. World War I. Communism. The Holocaust. Three extremely powerful blows. And I'm talking about Hasidim, not just Eastern European Jew in general. I'm speaking the Hasidic movement specifically. These are three gigantic blows. The First World War disrupted life of the course of four years, and in point of fact, the First World War lasted in Eastern Europe uh, until 1922. Right? The rest of Europe was 1940, 1918, but they kept fighting all through Eastern Europe until 1922. It was a gigantic war between Russia and Poland, for example, and there were huge wars in Ukraine. 100,000 Jews in the Ukraine, the great majority of whom were Hasidim, uh, were killed uh, by the Ukrainians in 1919 and 1920. How come you're not familiar with that? Saras Achronos Meshachas is Rishonas. Because he said, well, compared to the Holocaust, it's nothing. My God. It's true, but my God. Think about that. 100,000 Jews killed? That hadn't happened since Khmelnytsky. Eastern Europe had been although we don't think of it that way, a peaceful area for the Jews beforehand, in terms of violence. Eastern Europe was not an area of pogroms. The first pogroms happened in Russia in 1881. Then they were stopped. And then a few others started in, uh, after 1900 under Nicholas II. I'll say it again. People always talk about the Eastern European ghettos. There are no ghettos in Eastern Europe. People talk about Eastern European pogroms. There are very few of them until the First World War. And then right after the First World War comes this tremendous shrita. And that was the harbinger of the fact that uh, when does the killing of the uh, 100,000 Jews in Ukraine uh, stop? 120,000? When does it stop? When the Bolsheviks take over. <coughs> when the Red Army conquered Ukraine, uh, they killed the pogromists, they killed what they called the Whites. But they imposed a communist reign of terror, as we all know, which was obviously committed, among other things, to the extermination of Hasidism. I didn't say the Hasidim, but to the extermination of Hasidism, and they do it. Uh, by the time, as we all know, the Bolsheviks are finished, by the time you get through communism, there is no Hasidists left in Russia, except a few tiny groups here and there, you know, living subterranean uh, <laughs> lives. I myself saw a few when I was in the Soviet Union. Um, this is a tremendous hit. The Hasidic movement, which had so many mass, lost millions as a result of the First World War and communism. Okay? 
And I'm not even going to go into discussion of the fact that the war itself had a very powerful and deleterious effect on uh, traditional life in Europe in general. Uh, suffice it to say that nobody wants to be in a town where uh, you have young children, especially girls, and there are 500 soldiers uh, located a block away. I don't care whether they're Austrian soldiers, Hungarian soldiers, German soldiers, Russian soldiers, it's just not good. And you never had that, and now you have it for four years. Um, and then, after the First World War, the new map of Europe that is drawn is very dysfunctional. And as a result, the new states that arise, the Republic of Poland, uh, the new Hungary, which is truncated, uh, Romania, the areas that have this huge Jewish population, which are not under the communists, adopt consistent and violently anti-Semitic policies in ways that didn't exist before. That's why Rabbi Herzberg said that the uh, First World War was, uh, you know, the, before the First World War, things were better. Uh, everywhere the legal position of Jews deteriorates. The only exception to this was Czechoslovakia. If you lived there in the 20s and 30s, it was different. But everywhere else, it was not good. And uh, Hasidism will uh, start to be uh, affected by those trends in the 1920s and 30s, to which they do respond by uh, embracing uh, a certain amount of uh, modeling from other groups. Let's put it this way. The Hasidim in Poland uh, will develop their own version, believe it or not, of a kind of term der Heretz. A Beis Yaakov system was a Hasidic invention. Uh, they develop youth groups and uh, clubs and then they embrace the uh, European uh, total, totalizing party uh, system that uh, I don't think we're familiar with in this country but was a basic reality in Europe uh, to go I'll, I'll just give one more minute of this in Europe um, the socialists develop a system whereby not only do you see the political party on election day like you do over here and then you walk away but they provide you with uh, health insurance and a summer camp for your kids and um, you know unemployment insurance and a club to go on the weekend and tickets to the opera and if you live in Vienna they'll build you an apartment and all kinds of things of this nature meaning they want the club to be they want the party to be the place you live your entire life and all your friends are there and uh, the socialists do it then the Catholics copy them then the Hasidim copy the Catholics in the 1920s and 30s very interestingly I see we have Dr. Sperry he's, he's written about this and uh, the, the, uh, you wouldn't think that the Hasidic movement would, would be able to do it, and, and, and they're able to do it. But then, of course, comes the Holocaust. And then it's all put, paid. I uh, just want to conclude by making one observation about this, and that is, a number of years ago, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, something like that, I went to a um, lecture at the Hebrew College by a very famous Israeli professor, Joseph Dan. Uh, some may have heard of him, and he's like the successor of Gershon Shalom, if that means anything, uh, to, you know, if you've heard of him. And he's a very famous uh, professor at Hebrew University on the subject of mysticism, Hasidism, and all that kind of business. And that's why I went to see it. And Heshi Weinreb was there, and a whole bunch of other people were there. The majority of the people that were, that were there were religious. And the point he was making at that time was, Hasidism has demonstrated its bankruptcy because of its inability to respond theologically to the Holocaust. That's part in, in, uh, of his remarks. And uh, Rabbi Weinreb, I think this is around the time he just became the Rabbi Shomri. And uh, he got up and disputed this, and others got up and disputed this, and just then held his ground, and he said, you know, Hasidism is on its last legs because it's unable to uh, respond uh, in an appropriate fashion to the uh, tremendous, uh, as I say before, religious challenge of the Holocaust. <laughs> Lo and behold, a couple of years ago, I pick up a book, and I see an article by Joseph Dan called Hasidism the Third Century. <laughs> He changed his mind. <laughs> he says, I have to admit, he says, I'm not religious, I'm a secular Jew, militantly secular Jew. They're here, they're growing. No one ever imagined it. Look at the hits they took. As I think he talks about communism in the First World War and the Second World War and modernity. They located themselves in New York City. This is not some Amish retreat somewhere else. And they, 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 they managed to, polit they managed to, to uh, play the politi political uh, game in Israel better than anybody or as well as anyone else. Uh, they are a basic part of Jewish modernity. Uh, he changed his mind. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Uh, so uh, we'll have um, about five or six questions, uh, and there is refreshments in the back. Uh, and also, the folks in the uh, in the uh, the uh, social hall, if you want to bring in your questions, sir. Um, you mentioned that the Baal Shem Tov died in 1760, and that his principal follower died in 1782. 1772. I'm sorry. 1772. Prince. The market of Mezrich. Mezrich market. And what was what was he, what is he known for having done? That'll take us too. Let's see. You know, that, that's a good question. That'll take us too far. That's that's a good question. Unfortunately. <laughs> Any kind of unified effort on the part of the rebellion to kind of get together on their own to maybe disseminate a singular policy for Jews? You mean, you mean the Masnagdim or the Hasidim? I mean the Hasidim. Was there any kind of unified action on the Hasidic? The answer is no. I didn't go into this. Hasidism, among other things, has been, has been and still is distinguished by very bitter turf wars. That's, it's never affected their vitality, but it's part of you know, they, 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 they've always been uh, competing, let, let, let's put it in nice terms, they've always had a healthy sense of competition among the Rebbe's. <laughs> okay. Uh, how did the massacres of the late 1800s affect the growth of Hasidism? Uh, that's easy to answer. There were no massacres in the late 1800s. Okay. Rabbi, what was the... Why couldn't Hasidism have some internal strength against communism? What was it that had us? Hasidism couldn't hold out against communism, which was almost voluntary. You ask why didn't Hasidism manage to hold itself against communism? Have you ever read Solzhenitsyn? In other words, the 20th century invented something that never existed before, the totalitarian state. You have no idea, I mean, evidently you have no idea of the level of the penetration of the most individual elements of society by the secret police. And so, there was a, the government, for the first time, made a real effort using the Stalinism, using the, the, the police powers of the state to uh, go after, among the, all kind of groups, one of the groups they went after was ha religious Jews and Hasidim in particular. Uh, they also went after many other groups. And I would remind you, Stalin had no hesitation in killing 65 million people. So that kind of tells you that this was unprecedented. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. In a lighter vein, <laughs> my mother told me that I came from royalty. You came from royalty? My okay. great, great, and she was king of Poland. Oh, okay. But, that, but that's not Hasidic. That's, uh, uh, yeah, it uh, is Hasidic. No, 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 no. That, that happened in the 1500s. Well, oh, it didn't happen, but oh, okay. if it would have happened. It would have happened in the 1500s. Shaw Wall. Shaw Wall. Yeah. He was not Hasidic. He was? He was not Hasidic. This is the last one, I guess. It's hard to read the Hasidim of today. Are their philosophies still the same and still as strong? Uh, very Britain, very, it's a good question. The, the, the good questions you can't answer because they take too long. The, uh, the, the, the uh, short answer is, you say the philosophy. Hasidus, to answer it seriously, I, I'll go back to what I said earlier. Hasidus early on... Uh, broke up into lots and lots of different groups. Very, very different. <laughs> and it's fascinating for those people who are into it. You know, you have a, a study, I'm going to be doing a class in Hopkins, just on that sort of thing, you know. The different types and, uh, and different uh, uh, approaches. Um, and there's a vast difference, for example, between the Polish Hasidim on one hand, the Hungarian Hasidim, the uh, Hasidim in Russia, like Lubavitch, and, and those are anti lubavitch Hasidim in Russia, there are such things. <laughs> and, uh, and Ukraine, they, they have so many different ways. And, uh, and therefore, when you ask me the question, are their philosophies still the same and still as strong? Uh, yes and no. No, it depends which way. Are you referring to those Hasidic movements that were completely wiped out by Hitler? Of course you're not referring to that. Uh, are you referring to those Hasidic movements that survived the war and have rebuilt themselves in Israel or America? So, generally speaking, their philosophies are, are the same or as strong, except that now you're living in an entirely different environment, and so they have opportunities to do things that they weren't able to do before. Um, I really hope to say, you know, all kidding aside, I hope to save the discussion um, of how these movements play out nowadays, in the last 20, 30 years, 40 years, uh, for the final lecture where I, wanna, I would like to wrap it all up if we get there. Um, and indeed, 
the new reality that Hasidim find themselves in the United States of America and in the state of Israel obviously is a radically different reality than what they were in up to the Holocaust. Think of the difference, for example, between the Russian Empire on the one hand and the United States of America. No, seriously. Uh, they're in the freest country, uh, the most accepting and liberal country ever, and they're in New York City, you know, which is the center of multiculturalism and pluralism. Uh, that is a completely different environment which calls a sl for a slightly different uh, emphasis in their uh, philosophy and their approach and all, uh, all the rest. And in Israel, of course, they have the opportunity with government money, which they never had before, to build entire networks, social and educational networks, which they, which they never had the money to do before. So there are, of course, important differences in the modern time. Finally, I, I would say that there's a, there's a, a whole lot of similarity uh, because they define themselves as not being modern. They define themselves specifically within the Hasidic context as being exactly the same as uh, you know the originals of the Hasidic movement. They, it certainly, if you're a Ger Rebbe, you, a Ger Hasid, you define yourself as being faithful to all the traditions of the Chidush Rim from the 1800s onwards. Same thing. It's it's a good question, but it's a complicated answer because of the radically different nature of the current political and social reality in which Hasidism has found itself. They have left Eastern Europe because they were killed. Uh, they didn't want to go back after the Second World War because all communists. So they had to find themselves in new areas. This is what Joseph Dan was talking about, where he said nobody thought that they were able to make it. It fooled everybody. They were, if you ask uh, a German Jewish historian a hundred years ago, could Hasidism flourish in a Western context? It was, oh, no, never. It's all part of Eastern European fiddler on the roof, you know? And they were wrong. That's all we have time for tonight. We're back next week. Same back. Same back. Same back. Same back.